no matter how bad you are or what you've done wrong jesus paid the price the bible says for there's no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus the only requirement for you to go to heaven is jesus the only difference between you and those in the satanic church is jesus I got to the point where I realized that um, this is not about Christianity, this is not about Jesus, you know, it's not about saving souls. It was very dark, um, it was, it, it, it felt evil, and so we left. For me it was just a general sense of unease. Uh, when you go to visit somebody's house, it's not socially acceptable to take them through to your bedroom. In 2016, some groups of young South African students were on their way to school, and as they were walking along a path, their eyes came to a stop by a wetland, which was very close to a nearby local stream. And on moving closer to confirm what they had seen, a gruesome discovery would unfold. Today's story starts off like every other true crime story, and then spirals out of control into a deeper level of plots, twists, tongues, and bizarre details. However, I've done my best to keep it less complicated and easy to understand. Some of the people involved in this story will come to be members of one of the most infamous and notorious cult group in South African history. This story contains very gruesome and horrific details. Hence, viewers and listeners' discretion is highly advised. But before I start, if you're a lover of disturbing, dark, and mysteriously spooky through life horror stories, then you might consider subscribing turn on all post notifications to our channel and like the video if you find such content interesting and with that said let's get straight into today's story Kruger's Dorp is a small city that lies to the west of Johannesburg in the Gauteng province of South Africa. Founded in 1887, this once famous mining town now mainly consists of suburbia and farms. Characterized by low veld biodiversity, mine hills and natural attractions, Kruger's Dorp is the ideal weekend getaway destination. Visitors can expect to indulge in a variety of fun outdoor activities such as hiking trails, game reserves and visiting some amazing historical sites situated nearby. For those looking to indulge in a bit of game spotting, the Kruger's Dub Game Reserve provides a sanctuary for several game species. Kruger's Dub is also a great accommodation option as it lies between Johannesburg and an abundance of nature parks, bringing together the best of both worlds in Gauteng. In 2016, Living in Kruger's Dorp was a 52-year-old woman known as Hanley Latigan. Her LinkedIn profile showed she began her career in 2008 as a sales associate at a real estate company before progressing as an estate agent. She was a woman described as being wonderful as both a mom and a grandmother, even though she was a successful estate agent. For Hanley, her biggest achievement was her family. This would likely tell you the type of woman she was. She was a good friend to many who described her as kind, caring, and of course, deeply devoted to her Christian faith. On Monday, the 30th of May 2016, Hanley was to have a series of appointments. By 5.30 p.m. that day, she met up with one of her agents at a unit in an estate located in Shancliffe before leaving 20 minutes later, which was by 5.50 p.m. She had an appointment by 6 p.m. with a property owner. However, after 30 minutes of this property owner waiting for Hanley to show up for the property viewing, and she didn't show up by 6.30 p.m. that evening, the property owner became suspicious. This was unlike Hanley. Hanley loved her job, and if she was to have cancelled her appointment, she would have likely almost definitely called for cancellation or postponement. 
After the owner and colleagues tried to reach Hanley, including her family, and they couldn't get to her, people who knew her waited for a few hours to see if she could turn up. But by 8.45 p.m. that night, a missing person report would be made at the Kruger's Dop police station, while an urgent beyond the lookout alert for Hanley Latigan would be sent out across various emergency WhatsApp groups and on social media pages. One hour later, which was by 9.45 p.m., Hanley's branded vehicle would be found in another street and with a car parked in front of a private hospital. Another estate agent with whom Hanley was with before her disappearance when being questioned by the Kruger's Dop police unit would mention how she did not see anyone follow Hanley nor knew who she had an appointment with. With the aftermath of her mysterious disappearance, patrollers from all the community policing forums of Kruger's Dop would search around the premises for the missing woman until the early hours of Tuesday, the 31st of May 2016. But the search effort seemed fruitless. However, that same morning, around 6 a.m., in another suburb a few kilometers away from where Hanley was last seen, some group of pupils on their way to school would walk along a path where they made a gruesome discovery. They had found the body of a woman lying next to a stream in the area. The school children would stop a passing motorist to alert him of their discovery. And with what this motorist had just seen, the attention of the Rand Fontaine police would be called to the area. When the police came over, they would find the dead body of a woman in a veld. And a few hours later, around 3 p.m. that Tuesday, the body would be positively identified by the members of the family as that of Mrs. Latigan. The discovery left them devastated. It just didn't make sense to them. She was a nice woman who didn't cause problem. Who would do this to her? Why? What was the motive? The area was sealed off and an investigation would begin as officers began to trace the possible motives for the crime. With the news of Hanley's death spreading across Kruger's Dorp, fellow estate agents who heard about her mother began to express shock, including on social media as it raised the security concern for estate agents and insurance brokers around the city. It would turn out that this tragic news brought a lot of concern within the city, as that was another incident to happen in the area within a one month period and with one of such cases being the death of two insurance brokers who were murdered and locked in the boot of their cars. 19 days before Hanley's body was discovered, which was on the 10th of May 2016, a local broker known as Anthony Schofield was to have a meeting with a client at a local shopping center earlier that evening around 6 p.m. But when it was late night and none of his close family had heard from him, a missing person report would be opened. Patrollers and the police unit around the north of Kruger's Dorp would be called out by Anthony's wife to inquire if they had seen his vehicle anywhere during their search for him that late evening. Hours later, the patrolling members would confirm seeing Anthony's vehicle and alerted the police who reacted to the call out. The police noted the parked vehicle on the wrong side of the road at about 11 p.m. and upon approaching the vehicle, they noticed the keys of the vehicle were still in the ignition and proceeded to investigate. When they opened the boot of the vehicle, they discovered the body of a man covered with a black plastic bag. The victim's son and daughter-in-law met up with the police on the scene where the daughter-in-law positively identified the elderly man as her father-in-law. The deceased man was indeed Anthony Schofield. He had an injury to the head and his neck was blue, presumably from being strangled. And this assumption was later confirmed to be so. On reviewing the CCTV footage from a local primary school situated near the scene where his body was found, it would show his vehicle driving into the street and parking on the opposite side at around 8.50 p.m two hours before the body was discovered. The vehicle was however packed in a blind spot and the perpetrators cannot be seen in the footage. While questioning locals or any eyewitness living around the area, a bystander down the street would tell officials on the scene on how he saw three males climb out of the vehicle and walk down into another street. However, he wasn't able to identify who these men were. Was it a business deal gone wrong? 
or was an elderly man just brutally murdered and dumped in the boots of his vehicle? What was the motive behind this crime? However, the hunt for the suspects involved in this horrible act would continue. Living in Kruger's Dorp was also a 29-year-old man known as Kevin McAlpine, who was an insurance broker. Kevin and his pregnant wife was to officially celebrate their first wedding anniversary, three days before he went missing. For Kevin's wife, Kevin was a gentle giant and always made her feel safe and secure. On the 26th day of May 2016, Kevin would be meeting with new clients and with the appointment allegedly scheduled for 6 p.m. But after failing to return home that night, his family became worried. It was by 9 p.m. on that Thursday night that Kevin's mother had called the police in for him to report him missing. Would it take only 15 minutes to find his tracked vehicle? And on searching the boot, they would see a body. And few minutes later, Kevin's father would arrive at the scene, after which he positively identified the body of his own son in the boot of the vehicle. He had been brutally strangled and left in a black bag. An insurance consultant who helped him work on his proposal and quotes for the prospective clients he was going to see on that Thursday evening was the last to see him alive. This was just 16 days after Anthony Scofield's death and four days before Hanley Latigan's death. Now a clear pattern was beginning to emerge. Hanley, Anthony, and Kevin had appointments with potential clients just hours before they were discovered. And with the exception of Hanley Latigan, both men were found covered in plastic bags and dropped in the boots of their vehicles. With this, rumors also started surfacing that both men could have been murdered during an illicit trade or business deal gone wrong. This was however strongly denied by the police authorities as there was no evidence connecting either of both men to any illegal activity happening on those fateful nights. For the police, they believed that the motive for both Kevin's and Anthony's murders was the same. However, for the time being, the mystery was still there to be solved and the Kruger's Dub community were shocked and in fear. Some would ask the question, was a serial killer on the loose? This story is far from being over. To know what truly led to this horrifying pattern of death, we must go back to 2006, which was 10 years before this series of mysterious killings in Kruger's Dorp. It all started with a deadly invitation in which a friend invited a woman known as Rhea Grunewald along to a religious course on learning the evils of the occultic world. At the time, Ria Grunewald was a 52-year-old financial advisor who was fighting a struggling existence. She and her husband had been apart for some time and she relied deeply on her faith as a Christian. On the religious course she attended, she began to learn how to assist ex-Satanists who have broken free from the grip of the Church of Satan and prevent them from becoming involved in the occult again even though she didn't know much about the dark occultic. During that time, different stories about the satanic cult had taken hold of Kruger's Dub as people feared anything that had to do with the cult, devil worshipping and satanism and did their best to preach against it. Hence, just before the end of 2006, Rhea founded a non-profit religious organization known as the Overcomers Through Christ or OTC for short. The organization functioned as a spiritual ministry and initially focused on school children where Rhea would warn people against the influence of satanism and things like promiscuity and drugs that come along with it. Overcomers through Christ regularly performed at schools on the West Rand and Rhea would gain fame in spiritual circles and Kruger's top. Even the South African police would approach her at some stage to help with criminal investigations related to the occult. It was precisely through these soulful gatherings of overcomers through Christ members that drew in another person, a woman by the name of Marinda Stein. In January 2007, she had attended one of these prayer meetings at a school where the members of the OTC held a session. Marinda got so involved in the teaching that she told Ria, who was the head of the church, that she wanted to get involved in her ministry work. Like Ria, Marinda was a single mother and had two young children by the name of Laru and Marcel. 
Marinda admired Rhea so much and soon she became a full member of OTC and then in August 2007, Rhea's paths crossed with a 26-year-old Cecilia Stein. Cecilia was the perfect example of Satan's victims. She had just recently converted to Christianity. She would tell Rhea that she just exited a satanic church and that move had made her experience constant demonic attacks. These demons would make Cecilia sick day after day. Andrea, with her background knowledge of Satanism, took young Cecilia under her wings, determined to do whatever it took to help her. She believed her and made a promise to help her get out of the situation that she was in by praying for her. Then in 2008, Marinda Stein and Cecilia Stein's path crossed through Rhea, and Marinda quickly became part of a separate prayer group that stepped in when these demons attacked Cecilia, and Cecilia became the hub around whom Rhea's life revolves. Marinda and Cecilia became friends and their friendship became increasingly close even though both ladies lived a good 10 kilometers apart from each other and despite having the same surname they were not related. Rhea remained the glue that bound everything together and must intervene when the demons strike and this bothered Marinda who seemed to do anything for Cecilia as if to please her in any way possible. Initially, Cecilia would let Rhea know when she was short of spiritual intervention and Rhea would then call Marinda and other prayer groups to come and intercede for Cecilia during the weekdays while Marinda would help on weekends and during school holidays. That way, each had a time slot to look after Cecilia. But later, the attacks on Cecilia became so frequent and so severe that Cecilia could now never be left alone anymore. Otherwise, the demons would attack her and if she left the house or moved a certain distance away the demons would strike her dead Rhea and other members of the church offered to pray for her deliverance after Cecilia convinced them that the satanic church was now trying to take her soul away and this attack heightened when Cecilia started coughing blood through her mouth during each of these deliverance sessions Jesus name. We cut it off by now in Jesus name. In Jesus name. 
As the religious group overcomers through Christ kept Ria busier, Marinda and her children's attachments to Cecilia grew. Even through the night, someone was always there to guard Cecilia. Ria would always sleep on a single bed in Cecilia's bedroom at night. Cecilia's husband was a man by the name of Andre Stein, who worked as a police officer, and together they would later go on to have two children. It's important to mention that Cecilia and Andres never slept together in the same room as both seemed to be living separate lives at the time, even though they were practically under the same roof. Furthermore, the members of Overcomers Through Christ were forbidden from talking about anything spiritual in front of him and he was always at work on high nights when they would come over to protect Cecilia from satanic attacks. A strange marriage they had between both if you can put it that way. Hence, the police husband never seemed to know what always happened in Cecilia's room. Three years later, which was in 2011, Marinda would move in with her 15-year-old son, Laru, and 13-year-old daughter, Marcel, to an apartment building just down the road from the building where Cecilia, who was always sick, lived. They had moved so they could be closer to her. And in doing so, they also became Ria's neighbor. It was the children who were more often left with Cecilia to wash over her. They would even sometimes just miss school if no one else could look after Cecilia during the day. The children also had to move to a new high school in Kruger's Dorp as it was closer to where they lived. Although Marinda and her children would later move even closer in an apartment with a unit just diagonally above Cecilia's. On screen is the apartment where they lived. Ria would later start developing a religious course called Know Your Enemy, which was meant to teach the church members about Satanism. Ria and Cecilia worked together on this, but Cecilia was later taxed with organizing the curriculum. But Cecilia, who was an ex-Satanist, didn't seem to know that much about the subject and had tasked her best friend Candice with doing research for the manual, which ended up being cobbled together using information from websites. The foundation of the course was finally a manual of the same name compiled by both women. With the manual they had put up together directly from the internet, Candice would express her concerns regarding copyright infringements, which was one of the reasons why the author of the manual wasn't listed as Cecilia, but rather Zina, one of Cecilia's alter egos, allegedly stemming from her dissociative identity disorder which was a mental disorder Cecilia suffered from. The reason why the Know Your Enemy manual was also given the name Zina as an author was so that the course couldn't be directly linked to Cecilia if anything went wrong. Ria also began to spend more time with a man known as Reginald John Edwin Ben Dixon, a semi-retired pastor who was also her longtime friend. This man occasionally presented lectures at OTC Andrea regarded Ben Dixon as her mentor. Ben Dixon had a huge influence on Rhea, and as months went by, Rhea decided to change the direction of the new course, Know Your Enemy, as she felt it was too focused on Satan, rather than being focused on God. So she reached out to Cecilia and some other members of the OTC members about changing the course and its contents with a new name, which was to be called Know Your Savior. But this didn't sit well with Cecilia as she wanted to continue with the first course. 
it will turn out that Cecilia and Rhea were complete opposites in what they believed. But at the time, Rhea never knew that. Cecilia admired so many American evils such as Ted Bundy, Jack the Ripper, David Bakowitz, also known as the Son of Sam, including the notorious cult leader Charles Manson, which most of you would know as some of America's most infamous serial killers. Cecilia had also used her knowledge about these individuals to further help develop the course material for the Know Your Enemy course. But Rhea insisted on changing the direction of things and this seemed to be the moment that led Cecilia into triggering into action, the dark side of her that had been lying dormant for a while. With the disagreement on the course material to adopt for the church teaching, it started a fallout between both women as the relationship between Cecilia and Rhea turned sour. Cecilia became less involved in the religious activities till she completely broke away from the group. Rhea would eventually start believing that the satanic church had hacked her cell phone and email because Cecilia seemed to know her every move and her whereabouts. It was also around this period that Rhea also started doubting Cecilia's accounts on being attacked by Satan but kept on taking care of her. But a call she received made her decide to get out from Cecilia. The person who phoned her knew Cecilia very well and told her to get her way to save her own life and that Cecilia was nothing but trouble. She had a meeting with this anonymous woman and also with some of Cecilia's friends, with one of them who turned out to be Candice Rejavec. They told her everything about Cecilia since when they knew her. Well, it would turn out that not only was Cecilia a mountain of trouble, but she was also very manipulative and controlling. Cecilia had also described herself as a fourth generation witch and a bride of Satan. It was after Rhea found out that Cecilia had been lying to her for the longest time about being attacked by demons and needing to be constantly guided that she decide to cut the relationship with Cecilia. More of Cecilia's web of lies would unfold throughout this story. Cecilia, in a bid to start her own religious group together with Marinda Stein, who had been taking care of her, including Marinda's two children, Laru and Marcel Stein, then along with Isaac Valentine, who was an insurance broker, and his wife Michaela Valentine, a travel agent, all of whom were ex-OTC members, formed Electus Pe Deus. Electus Pe Deus is a Latin word which in English means choosing by God. And together, this group of persons who start their own activities with Cecilia, obviously being the leader of the group, on July 2nd, 2012, as the OTC church members came to attend the new OTC course during one of their prayer meetings, a certain group of people would make their way to the church premises and would place homemade bombs under the cars of the church members. But before these people could ignite the explosive, they would be nearly spotted and had to flee before they could be caught. Over the following days, after the meeting with Rhea and Candice who exposed who she was as a person, an unknown person would try to break down Rhea's door. And after ignoring calls from Cecilia, another person tried to break through her burglar bars. This person told Rhea that Cecilia was losing it and someone needed to come and pray for her. It would be safe to say that all these series of attacks being directed at Rhea were from Cecilia in a desperate bid to make it seem like Rhea was now under satanic attack for abandoning her. The Electus Pe Deus were the group of persons that had planted those explosives on the cars of the OTC members with the intention of destroying their properties, even going as far as breaking into Rhea's house. But Rhea was no longer playing Cecilia's game and she subsequently asked Marinda Stein to take over Cecilia's care. Rhea would also tell Cecilia that she was not allowed to come to the Know Your Savior sessions anymore. Cecilia on hearing this told Rhea that she had met with Satan and Satan said he was not playing anymore. Rhea believed this to mean that the attacks on Cecilia would worsen because the satanic church wanted her back. But little did she know that Cecilia had other agendas in mind. After a huge disagreement, the two parted ways. Andrea started ignoring any sort of messages about Cecilia's satanic attacks. On July 11, 2012, Cecilia and her accomplices using homemade bombs on their second attempt 
would successfully set off explosives near cars at an OTC meeting. This was just nine days after their initial failed attempt after this unsettling attack, even though there were no casualties. Rhea began to feel responsible and realized that she wouldn't want her members to get hurt. She then took it upon herself to flee the church as she knew she was being targeted and was not willing to risk the lives of the other believers. But for Cecilia, it didn't end there. To exert her revenge on Rhea for quote, abandoning her, Cecilia decided to punish her. But her method of punishing was not to harm or kill Rhea. Cecilia, being the mastermind of her group, decided that the best way to get back to Rhea was to target those around her and this was what she did next. In the same month of July and the following month of August 2012, various threats would also be sent via text messages by Cecilia's groups to various OTC members and other people who were in close association with Rhea. Later that month, a fire would be started by some group of people at a full gospel Christian church. The leader of the Christian center was a man by the name of Pastor George Neld. This man had his car broken into. His church almost burned down. Windows were also damaged while Cecilia and the rest of her group also threatened him at gunpoint. A note which in English read, Rhea, who is going to protect you now, would be found after it had been placed on the gate of the center. And guess who had written the note? It was Cecilia. It would turn out that after this series of attacks, Cecilia became more obsessed with executing revenge on Rhea who at this point was now considering disbanding the ministry. But just before the OTC was disbanded, a woman by the name of Natasha Boga, who was an active member of OTC, would write a prayer that was read out at one of the meetings. Cecilia went a step further into these attacks by slashing Natasha's vehicle tires and accusing her of praying a so-called dangerous prayer that led to the death of 171 orphanage children. This news of course broke Natasha, who was also a neighbor to Cecilia Stein, even though it was obviously a false accusation. Rhea would later meet with Cecilia to tell her that she was disbanding her ministry, but Cecilia apparently did not like this and said that she thought bombs were bad, and that from then onwards, that people would have to pay with their lives. The group, after days of following Natasha closely to find out exactly where she lived, would begin to plot. Celia had convinced the Valentines, Zach and Michaela, to kill the 33 year old Natasha Boga. So the next day, which was on July 26, 2012, just a day after they had thrown explosives on the cars and after Ria had made mention of her plans to end the ministry, the Valentines entered the Pretoria home of his 68 years old Joyce Bonzaya, a close friend of Natasha Boga and made her write a note asking Natasha to come to her flat when she returns from work. Michaela then took the note and slipped it under Natasha's flat and when Natasha arrived to see her friend that evening, Zach would viciously stab both her and Joyce Bonzaya to death while Michaela, who was also at the scene, fled the house in shock after the murders. It had been Cecilia's intention to scare Natasha into stopping the prayers and this seemed to be the reasoning Cecilia used to convince the group to kill Natasha, who died with the written note still within her grasp. Joyce was killed because she was a witness to the gruesome killing of Natasha. This was the group's first and second murder aimed at the OTC Christian group. However, it didn't end there. Cecilia, on learning that Michaela shaken out during the killing, would purchase a pig, which the group would use to practice particularly on how to stab. Days after Natasha's and Joyce's death, Rhea started receiving various SMS asking her if she could see the next one coming, while being told by the group in one of those SMSs that Natasha squealed like a pig while she was being killed. Over the following days, the Electus Pedeus group would set their eyes on 75-year-old Reginald John Edwin Bendixson, the man whom Rhea regarded as a mentor and had helped develop the Know Your Savior course. Cecilia had been so jealous of Rhea's close relationship with Ben Dixon that she had told Rhea that every time she spent time with Ben Dixon, she would bring back demons to cause problems for her. Over the following week, 
Rhea would receive an SMS asking her if she had said goodbye to Reginald Bendixson. Rhea didn't reply to this message. Instead, she sent the SMS to a police officer who told her not to worry and that nothing was going to happen. They all thought it had just been a threat. This was what happened next. On August 13, 2012, 18 days after the two murders, Zach Valentine and Marinda Stein disguised as police officers. The police uniforms had been given to them by Cecilia who took the clothing from her police husband's closet who seemed not aware of the plans and killings going on. Zach and Marinda were accompanied by her 14-year-old daughter Marcel Stein as they entered John Ben Dixon's home in Johannesburg pretending to question the old man about the death of Natasha and Joyce, whom they clearly knew they themselves had killed. At a point, Zach stood behind John Bendixson and signaled to Marinda that he was ready to strike and he then attacked the retired pastor on the head, the hand axe. John Bendixson died after being stabbed multiple times by Marinda in a frenzy. By 7 p.m. that evening, Rhea was informed by the police that Ben Dixon had been killed. Marinda, who played a huge role in killing John Ben Dixon, would later describe her first killing as exciting and an adrenaline rush. Over the following weeks, leading to Ben Dixon's funeral, as Rhea was about to make her way to the funeral, she would find a bloodied note at her door which read, Sorry, this is all the dogs left you. Here is your own piece of Reggie. On top of the note was the bloodied piece of an organ, which would later be discovered to belong to a pig. Following this harassment and series of deaths, Rhea knew that as far as she was around Kruger's stop, the lives of those around her were at great risk. She decided to change her name and relocated far away to a place where she felt safe from Cecilia's madness after the group's death killing. By this point, Michaela Valentine, the wife of Zach Valentine, had become disillusioned with the group's activities and wanted out. This was a group which she had earlier thought to be chosen by God, as the name suggested. But the activities were now looking like that of a dark cult. Cecilia had earlier convinced them that the killing was done for God. But for Michaela, the group activities were beginning to look like that, chosen by Satan and she made it known to the group that she wouldn't want to be a part of them anymore. However, the group regrouped themselves and now saw Michaela as a liability or a loose end. And after some contemplation, her husband Zach and Cecilia made a plot to kill her too. But first, the group knowing that Zach would be the first suspect if his wife was to be killed, decided that he, Zach, established an alibi by going early to work on the day they had planned the killing. This was on October 4, 2012, just short of two months after their third kill. Before leaving the house for work that morning, Zach made sure to put some sleeping pills in Michaela's coffee to make her drowsy. She had also given Marinda a set of his house keys and a gate removed for easy access into the house he shared with his own wife. That Thursday morning, Marinda and her daughter Marcel, who was 14 at the time, made their way into Zach's house through his garage and then sneaked into the house where they met a 25-year-old Michaela still laying and sleeping on the bed. Michaela's death was the most gruesome as both ladies smashed her head with a blunt object which bounced Michaela's head back and forth on the pillow she laid her head. When she managed to wake, Marinda had told Michaela to pray as she was about to kill her which Michaela did. She started praying for her life before being stabbed more than 60 times with a young Marcel joining her mother in the killing. Michaela's intestines and blood were then spattered on the ceiling of her house. She became the fourth victim. That evening, Zach would return home with an estate agent who made a shilling discovery with Zach. But for Zach, what mostly mattered to him was the safety of his cat and whether the house could still be sold. A question which at the time slightly unsettled the agent. Now Zach have his wife out of the way and that successfully established an alibi, wife fully knowing how they had carried out the killing. The wife's death and the previous deaths would remain under investigation and even after some of the members of Electus Bay Deus were questioned, no evidence was found to indicate they had been the ones who had carried out the killings. Zach's alibi 
also proved successful. Meanwhile, Cecilia wasn't yet satisfied. She then planned to have Ria's son murdered. But the three men she had hired with the killing never carried it out. As for Ria's daughter, no harm came to her since she was out of the country. With this, her revenge on Ria seemingly ended. With the hitmen who had been hired by Cecilia backing out from doing the job and having disappeared altogether, Cecilia feared that this meant the police authorities were now on their tails, secretly watching and monitoring their movements. She had thought that the police were secretly investigating them for the murders. Cecilia asked that the group lay low from their crimes, and with this, the group activities went silent. After being dormant for a while, with no obvious targets in mind, now fast forward three years later, which was in 2015, Electus Pay Deus started running out of money. Zach Valentine, who had already contributed 2 million rand from his own pocket throughout those years for the group's cause, would quit his job and start his own venture, borrowing money from his parents and in-laws, including various other people. At the time, the only employed individuals from the group were Zach, Larustein, who worked as Zach assistant, and Marinda, who was an English teacher in high school. The money they made we are regularly given to Cecilia, who made them believe that the money was needed for an orphanage run by her. Though records would later show that this orphanage never existed. At the time, only Cecilia knew this as she was actually unemployed even though she had told the group that she was a psychologist, which of course were part of her lies. The rest of the group members believed her as they had been completely manipulated by her and always ready to do her evil biddings. With the group even getting a similar tattoo representing the Electus Pay Deus symbol and various other tattoos which was allegedly done to prove their loyalty to Cecilia. In need of money, Cecilia then devised a scheme to obtain money through insurance fraud, theft and more of these killings while the rest of the group who believed they were committing these crimes for a good cause participated in good faith. A new group member of Electus Pedeus would be a man by the name of John Barnard, who was a printmaker. And since the group needed money, John came up with a very disturbing plan to make money. He was taxed with setting up a meeting between some members of the group and his employer. A man by the name of Peter Meyer, with the purpose of the meeting being to discuss a business venture. On November 27, 2015, Zach Valentine, Marinda Stein, and her daughter, Marcel Stein, would arrive at the mayor's home in Kruger's Dorp. When they arrived, they were welcomed into their home for the business talk, and it would have been a matter of few moments when the group revealed their true intentions. A 51-year-old Peter Meyer, together with his 47-year-old wife, Joan Meyer, had their hands tied up. The group then demanded money. Obviously, they had not been there to discuss any sort of business venture, and the plan John Bernard came up with was for the group to rob his employer, whom he thought had millions of francs hidden within a safe in their home, as he knew the man had made plans to purchase a multi-million property, a water park. However, on checking the safe, the group found out that the couple didn't have much money on them as the group only managed to get 700 rands out of both. Out of anger, Zach subsequently stabbed both to death. This was the group's fifth and sixth victim. On returning to their flat in Kosana, Cecilia wasn't happy at all with the 700 rand cash, cell phone, wallet and with the useless bank cards they brought her because this meant they were still broke. After the Meyer scaling, Cecilia's next scheme involved faking Zach Valentine's death to get their life insurance payout of 3.5 million rands. Zach of course agreed to this. Then the group began to befriend a street vendor who would regularly sell snacks near the Kosana flats. This street vendor was a man by the name of Gerald Jackson. Almost three weeks after the Maya killing, on December 16, 2015, Jackson, together with John Bernard, Zach Valentine, Marinda Stein, and her son, Laru Stein, 
left in two cars for another province in South Africa, known as Free State, with one of the cars being Zach's Valentine's BMW and the other car being his Mercedes-Benz SLK. This province was 360 kilometers away from the city of Krugersdorp, where the group lived. Zach had asked Jackson to join them for the travel. Zach and Jackson were in the front seats of Zach's BMW, while Laro was seated on the passenger seat behind Jackson. Marinda and John followed in Zach's other car. During their journey, Laro gave Jackson a juice beverage with sleeping tablets mixed into it. Cecilia, who wasn't traveling with the group, had taken the tablets from a box of medicines which they had grounded up and mixed into the juice. While still on the way, the sleeping tablets kicked in and they proceeded to inject Jackson's body with an insulin before Laru proceeded to strangle him. After that, the group traveled to a less busy provincial route where they left Zach's car in a veld which is basically a type of wide open rural landscape in South Africa. Particularly, it's just a flat area covered in grass. After stopping at the veld, they then placed Jackson's disease body in the driver's seat of Zach's Mercedes car and the car was then set alight after paraffin had been poured over it. It would turn out that the sinister reason for befriending Jared Jackson was to use him as Zach's double for the life insurance front and particularly for Cecilia to get the insurance payout of more than 3.5 million rands. Jackson was also used as he was more or less Zach's age, build and height. For the group to get this money meant that Zach had to be dead and since Zach was diabetic and needed regular use of insulin, they had obtained one which they used on Jackson when his beverage drink was drugged and when he was still unconscious. And after they felt that the blood had carried the injected insulin around his body, they then proceeded to strangle him. To make it more believable that Gerald Jackson was indeed Zack. Zack himself proceeded to put his wedding ring on Jackson's body before Gerald Jackson, who was allegedly still alive but unconscious, together with the car, was set alight. Unfortunately, Jackson became their seventh victim. His body was burnt beyond recognition. After this, the group would drop Zach off at the hotel that night after one of the cars had been sacrificed for the sinister purpose and the rest of the members all drove back to Kruger's Dorp in Zach's BMW. The following day, during the police investigation into the remains in a car, Marinda would identify Jackson's shard remains as the body of Zach Valentine thus obtaining a death certificate which the group had planned to use to secure the insurance payout. Cecilia was to be the main beneficiary. Zach Valentine, who had already been booked into a hotel in Kruger's Dorp with a new name using a fake ID, would begin to hide out there until April 2016. And as the payment for the hotel was becoming a burden for the group, he would move to Kiakaha Ministries in Kruger's Dorp a payment-free place meant for the homeless drug addicts or people who have been abused, rejected or who had no other refuge and had come to freely seek for refuge. He kept a low profile for two months while staying there using his fake names while the rest of the group continued with their evil crimes. Welcome to Discovering Life Claims. You're speaking to Melba. How am I with you? Hello, Nadu. This is Larry. How are you doing? Good, and you? I'm okay, thank you. Can I give you a policy number? Yes, you may. It's 5130. Yes. 954. Yes. 729. Is it for Z Valentine? Yes. Uh, how can I assist you? Yeah? Um, I don't have his ID number. I only have the uh, number we worked under when he was a broker at Discovery. Okay. I also worked with him. I was his assistant. I have to give the ID number for the security reasons and stuff like that. But his ID number starts with eight five zero three zero eight. Mm -hmm. And then his intermediary number was double one double zero one seven nine seven six nine. That's the number we worked under. Okay. And the thing is, he passed away yesterday. Now I just want to find out what do we need. So the policy can pay out to the to the beneficiaries as necessary. 
and then uh, we can work for the, uh, further uh, from that. So just tell me what we need to send you guys um, now in the following next period. Okay, I'm sorry to hear about the death. You said I'm speaking to? Laru. Laru, can I yes. have your broker code or entity? Um, I, well, I used to work there but it was about six months ago. It's, I think it's double one double zero. Oh, give me your ID. That's really bad. You don't expect somebody to go just pass away. Yeah, shame. And he's still so young, eh? It is, yes. Man. Did he have any uh, kids or wife? No, he, he, he didn't have kids. And uh, his wife was quite nice, actually. We knew her quite well as well. But a okay. few years ago, they broke into the house. And sadly, she was there and she got murdered as well. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man. <laughs> Is he your best friend? Well, basically, yes, and I've known him since I was basically 12 years old, and we did karate together, we went fishing together, we did everything together. I didn't have a father in my life, or a big brother, so he was oh. basically the big brother, the father, the everything. He was, I see. <laughs> and he's the only male role model in my life, so... And I, I just turned 20 the other day, I mean, we did everything together. When we went, we, when he drove just to a shop, he said, let's come with, let's go. I mean, we, we basically did everything together. Amen. That's why we were really close, and that's why he said if anything happens to him, I must make sure his mom is okay, his cats are okay, his family, his everything sorted out. And what's your mom's name? Uh, my mom's name is Marinda. Marinda. Yes. And um, my aunt's name, uh, who's, who's known him since he was basically seven years old, Cecilia State. Oh, I see. So uh, basically, um, I'm going to need to forward the, the requirements through to the broker, Reshma, okay. uh, because if you if we have to send it to you, we're going to need a letter of authority, okay, from the beneficiary. Okay. So um, I'll forward it through to the broker. You're more than welcome to contact the broker if you want to deal with it, and you can get a letter of authority from the beneficiary. Um, okay. I've got the, I'm here with the beneficiary, she's here in the room, but she's like, she's really devastated. Um, okay. yeah, she, she's really, really devastated. Um, must I give her the phone by any chance, or um, must, if you said, guys, send the yes. email, let her send you the email, or... Okay, you can, if she can agree for me to send the requirements through to you, then uh, that will be fine. I, I won't need to send it to the broker. Okay, just give me a second. Sure. Um, see, there's me the agreement for the beneficiary. Let's ask if you get an audio email. Hello? Hi, I'm speaking yes. to? Um, Cecilia Stein. Uh, Cecilia, please can you confirm your ID for me? Um, okay, it's, uh, what's my ID number, Mensa? Um, 80? Yeah. Um, okay, can you just give me five, five minutes, please? No problem. Well, I didn't make any phone call. Um, okay, I can't see. It's eight zero. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Okay, uh, can you just confirm and verify for me over the phone if it's okay for me to send the requirements to LaRue's email address? Um, yes, yes. He used to work with Zach at the company, so okay. um, he knows all his, all his, um, all his, uh, Okay, no problem. Thank you very much, and I'm very okay. sorry for your loss, eh? Thank you very much, It's eh? a pleasure. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Awesome, thank you very much. No problem. I really do appreciate your It's a pleasure, hey? Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Hello. Okay. Hi. 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 Hi.
Oh. It's Cecilia. Sorry, I thought it was Celia. No, it's Cecilia. Okay. Unlike the 37th one. Uh, okay. Yeah, from grandmother to mother to grandmother to mother. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. I'm from Discovery Life. Okay. Um, the Mr. Zach Ballantyne yes. had a policy with us. Yes, yes. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that he worked with us as well. Yes, yes, I know. After he left APSA, he went to Discovery Legs to work with, with him. Okay, you so know him quite well. I've known him since he was seven years old. Yes. Since seven, okay. So, yes. okay, obviously that's why um, you're his beneficiary. I was his beneficiary when I was still married to his wife, so, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any specific reason? That just sounds odd, sorry. Again, no, no, no. Um, he had that before he got married, and, and he never, never changed it. Oh, he never changed it. it. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. When he started working with Discovery, I think he got another one as well okay. for, for her. That's probably either the kids' cell phone yeah. or tablets. Next is Jonah. I think my it's spill. It's probably the two. Try to not speak the language. So just put a little bit softer. Pause that. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Now 100%. Um, thank you. And his wife. Where's his wife? She died uh, four years ago. Okay. Yeah. All right. And he never got remarried. No. 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 Although we tried. We we, we didn't want to see anyone after after that. So okay. All right. And did they have any children? No. No, no children. He didn't want kids because he was diabetic, so he was always afraid he would give it to his kids as well. Because his dad is a diabetic as well. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Alright. Um, did something bad happen to his wife or something? Yeah, um, they broke into their house and um, she got killed trying to... I'm aware. Uh, a home invasion? Yes, yes. They killed her for her tablet, her wedding ring, and they tried to steal her car. They couldn't. Uh, she had a anti something hijacking thing in her car. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they, they couldn't. So they found what else did they find with him besides the dog tags to um, identify that it was him in the car? Uh, I don't know if they found this item or anything. No, they, they couldn't find anything really. Uh, as the windscreen was everything. melted into a ball this big. Okay. I was, I was in the police state now a few weeks ago. The whole car burned to such a crisp, basically. Mm -hmm. But the windshield is a ball of, a ball of glass like that. It melted okay. into a ball of glass like that. The so brake discs melted. Yeah, the rims melted. It's flat. The guy from yeah. the forensics explained to us that in 15 minutes a car can completely burn out completely. Yeah. Um, the, his fishing stuff that was in the trunk actually burned away yeah. to nothing. Um, so, so yeah, it's just just his personal stuff, like his wedding ring that that he still wore, that he had on. Um, the dog tags they found in the car, not even around his his um, his, his body, his, his remains. His arms and legs were completely burned off. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah. So. Um, Okay, no, 100%. I understand that. Um, I deal with these on a daily basis, so it's difficult. And the other thing is, we have to make sure before we honor claims like this mm -hmm. that it is actually our deceased that is the person yeah. that, um, that burnt out. The police said as well, sorry for all the questions, and yeah. you know, they want yeah. to be you know, in what mood he was in. He yeah. was going fishing, he was always excited about yeah. fishing. He unpacked yeah. that fishing case of his like 50, 50 times. times. Um, you know what my house smelled like? Because he had what? Ox blood and... Ox blood oh. and some other liver. Uh, the you, dips. you open it, mm. yeah, you, you, you can't breathe. Yeah, yeah. My, my case is in a store and it's there for a good reason. Yeah. For the dips, yeah. You yeah. can't yeah. one you want to eat. Yeah. Yeah, some of the others. And okay, and... and yeah, I, you see, you actually put out, pulled out the gun and said, okay, give me all your stuff. Now, I'm used to my father having massive guns, West 44, Magnum, I mean, mm -hmm. that's a massive uh, revolver. He's got 303s, 308s, uh, 306, um, that's, that's, that's hunting rifles, it's big guns. Mm -hmm. This guy pulls out the small looking thing and it's like, play on that's a toy. Good, and, uh, yeah, I hit him with the elbow, he went down, as I turned around, he shot me. And mm -hmm. I just felt that I can't walk anymore, and I fell, and then everything went black, and after a while it's like crawling and walking, came back home, said to mom, no, I got shot, take me to the hospital. You, you, you're not shot, where's all the blood? It's, it's 
Yeah, yeah that, was, that was actually bad. <laughs> you know, don't tell your friends, eh? No, no, I haven't. He's <laughs> <laughs> left, left, left it down there. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 If I walk out this door, don't get shot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, um, the reason why I'm asking about the finances is because mm -hmm. this policy was reasonably new. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it only started like in um, in November, the month prior to Yeah, because what demise. happened was he had one while he was working at Discovery. That's right. So um, when he left, he had to redo all of them. Okay. And then there was something about his medical aid because stuff changed because while he was working at Discovery... Um, Okay, because he actually did not um, pay a single premium to towards his no, policy. He was still busy sorting all, all his stuff out. So he had one before that, that just went over to, to a new one. That's yeah. as far as I could. Yeah, but to this policy, when we debited him in September, mm -hmm. October, November, the policy. The, the premiums never went off. Okay, but I'm then there was I've a no then there was a deposit made, a cash deposit made to bring the policy into life again. Yes, there was also one made for his medical aid. Yeah. Okay. I, I know that for a fact. Do you have any records of that? Do you, how do you know that as a, as a fact? So uh, it's just I to help can, us. Oh, sorry, I can show you on my internet thing. Let me just check I, I know that for a fact. Uh, did, did you make the, the payment? Yeah, uh, he went from his normal account to his business account. Okay. And he wanted to pay it into their account, but his internet banking was involved. Is that Okay. Yeah, Andrew said there's not more than that cash is going now. Okay. Okay. No, look, that's fine. No, I should um, have it on my own. You can email it to me when you get a chance, but there, um, I'm, I'm just. Let me just check here. Let me just should have it here. Got yeah, it. Cash it deposit here on the eighth. December. Oh no, I did it on the fifth. Uh, I did it on the fifth of, of December already. It reflects the eighth. Maybe. It reflected on the eighth. Oh, maybe, it maybe, on the eighth. Yeah, maybe when we did. Not. As for Zach's discovery life insurance policy, which they had planned to claim, the group were not able to succeed after several attempts, as discovery group, which was Zach's employer, suspected foul play. The blood type obtained at the scene of the burn vehicle didn't match that of Zach's. Hence, the group had to give up. But disturbingly, this meant that the killings had to continue. The group then decided to embark on a series of appointment models, and this was the way they would do it. They would set up an appointment with an identified victim under false pretexts. Marinda, Larue, and John Bernard would typically intimidate victims into handing over their bank cards. Marcel would then go to a nearby ATM and verify that the PIN was correct. Once confirmed, the money would be withdrawn and the victims would be violently murdered Why the money goes to the leader Cecilia, who of course wasn't always part of the deadly operations. The first victim by appointment and who was the eighth victim of the group's kill count was a man by the name of Glenn McGregor, a 57-year-old tax consultant from Kruger's Dub, to whom John Bernard had suggested to the group to be the target. Marinda, Marcel, Larue and John Bernard met McGregor at Randfontein on January 27, 2016, which was almost six weeks after the death of Jared Jackson. Marinda had earlier told the man that she wanted help with filing her taxes and had made an appointment with him. And when the group arrived at the man's place, Marinda told Glenn that they were robbing him, to which the man supposedly simply laughed at her in response. When he stood up, Marinda fired two shots at him. He fell to the ground and did not get up after that. The group then looked around for money but did not find anything. So Marinda forced him to transfer 6,000 rands into her own account, which she did. Sadly after doing so, 
Marinda proceeded to smother him with a plastic wrap that she had brought along with her. But that didn't work before Larue, her son, proceeded to strangle him, moving his body away from the window to avoid drawing suspicion due to the gun sounds. His body was then dragged by Larue and Marcel and dumped in a bath as the group opened the tap and left the water running. Allegedly, Marinda had made the group do this as she believed this would wash away any evidence. Three and a half months later, after Glenn's death, which was on the 10th of May 2016, Anthony Schofield, a 64-year-old insurance broker, was the group's second victim by appointment and the ninth victim of the group's kill count. The four lured Anthony to their flat in Kruger's dub and forced him at gunpoint to hand over his bank cards and ATM pin. After he did so, they stole his belongings and withdrew 16,600 rands from his bank account and used his cards at various shops in Kruger's dub. Anthony was eventually strangled to death in the flat where Marinda lived. His body was dumped in the boot of his vehicle, which was then abandoned by the roadside. Just two weeks after Anthony's death, which was on May 26, 2016, a 29-year-old Kevin McAlpine, who was also an insurance broker, was also lured to their flat in Kruger's Dorp and forced to hand over his bank cards. 1,300 rands was withdrawn from his account and all his valuable belongings such as his wedding ring, laptop, shoes and wristwatch were stolen. He too was strangled and left in the boot of his car. He became the third victim by appointment and the tenth victim of the group's scale count. Cecilia was not at all happy with the loot from Kevin's murder. The 1,300 rands wasn't enough for even half of one of her psychology consultations, as she claimed. According to her, it was not a lot of money. Electus Pedeus almost immediately started planning the next appointment murder. Over the following days, Marinda was going through a newspaper when she spotted a Remax Masters advertisement, a real estate or property company in South Africa. Cecilia liked the idea of approaching an estate agent, seen as financial advisor, who so weren't producing as much money as she had hoped. Four days after Kevin McAlpine's murder, Marinda contacted the estate agency and made an appointment with Hanley Latigan. The 52-year-old Hanley sold property in Rodoport and Kruger's Dub on behalf of Remax Masters. On making a call, Marinda said she was from Cape Town and wanted to discuss a house in the Kruger's Dub area with Hanley as her husband had found a job at one of the mines which of course were all lies. Marinda pretended not to have any transport and asked whether Hanley could pick her up at a net care hospital across the road from Kosana for the appointment. At 3 p.m. Monday afternoon, the 30th of May 2016, just four days after Kevin's death, Hanley had gone to fetch her husband's iPad at the office because she wanted to take photographs of the property to show Marinda. Andre and Hanley had been together for 34 years and had three adult children between them. That afternoon, Andre never knew that was the last time he would see his wife alive. Meanwhile, emotions were running high at Kosana. Marcel had just received very good news. Some time ago, without telling the others, she had applied to study medicine at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. That day, she heard that she had qualified for provisional admission. She was a little apprehensive about telling her mother and Cecilia because they had been insisting for a long time that she would not be allowed to leave the house. If she wanted to study, she would have to do it via distance learning so that she could stay at home. The studies that Marcel dreamt of, however, could not be completed through distance learning. Marinda exploded when Marcel shared the news and threatened to get rid of her just as they had done with Michaela. She accused Marcel of failing the group. This time, Marcel took no notice of the threats. But the prospect of making something of her life made her fear that Hanley's mother would be bushed and would thus thwart the plans she had for her future. Late that afternoon, Hanley headed off to pick Marinda from the Kosana flat where they lived so she could be shown the property, after which she would meet a colleague at 6pm at another property. 
she informed the owner of the house who wanted to sell it off that she was running a little late as she still had to pick up a client who in this case was Marinda. As soon as the members of Electus Payday was heard that Hanley was on her way, they took up their positions in their homes. As usual, Cecilia stayed in her own apartment as if she were completely unaware of what was going to happen. Once again, the music was blaring from John Bernard's bedroom so as to block out any sort of scream like he normally does during the previous appointment killings. But this time, Marcel was keeping busy in her mother's kitchen. The details of the plan to lure Hanley to the appointment remain unclear, although they almost certainly relate to Marinda's lying about not having transport. But as with the case of Anthony and Kevin, they knew that another death awaited. This time, Marinda didn't follow the usual kitchen routine but produced a .38 special revolver from her handbag as soon as Hanley entered the apartment. She wasn't interested in buying a house, she told Hanley. What she wanted was Hanley's bank cards. Hanley cooperated and lay down on the floor so that LaRue could bind her hands behind her back with a rope. Her bank hands were taken from her purse so that John and Marcel would go test them. At first, Hanley was too rattled to remember the pins or cleverly pretended that she was unable to. But eventually, Jean and Marcel left with the correct numbers. CCTV cameras captured Marcel wearing a beanie in front of the ATM at 6.35 p.m. that evening as Jean waited patiently in Marinda's car. This time, Marcel didn't just test the pins, she wanted to withdraw the money too. The first ATM generated a faulty message. The next one showed two balances which confused Marcel. She still hadn't managed to withdraw any money. As soon as she tried to, she received a false message. They visited more ATMs but got the same message every time. Meanwhile, Marinda phoned to ask why they were taking so long and after Masao explained that she hadn't managed to make any withdrawals. For her part, Hanley convinced Marinda that Marcel could not be able to withdraw money from that specific account before first transferring money into it. Marinda then decided to force Hanley to transfer all the money to one account in the hope that they would simplify things. Marinda returned Hanley's cell phone to her so that she could make the transfer. But instead, Hanley did something very clever before she was eventually killed. She transferred a huge sum of money to her husband's account in the hope that he would become suspicious. Her strategy worked. Andre received an SMS notification from the bank that the transfer from one of their bank accounts to another had taken place and because they very seldom used that account, he immediately wanted to find out from his wife what was going on. Marinda, however, suspected that Hanley was trying to outwit them and retrieve the cell phone from her. She handed it to LaRue so that he could check whether he was able to raise the limit on the cards of Hanley's internet banking profile or better still, transfer the money electronically to an account from which they would be able to withdraw it. But LaRue had no luck. While LaRue was working on Hanley's cell phone, someone SMSed her and Andre tried to call her to find out why the money was being transferred. After the unanswered call, LaRue switched off her cell phone when he realized that people were already trying to find Hanley. It's unclear why, but at one stage, Marcel was able to withdraw 3,000 rands in cash. Andre again received an SMS notification of the transaction and then another one in that someone was trying to withdraw more money than what was available in the account. Andre was still trying to figure out what was going on when Rihanna Boga, who was another estate agent or colleague of Hanley's, called him to ask where Hanley was as she had never arrived for their 6 p.m. appointment. That was when Andre realized that something was horribly wrong. After Marcel informed her mother and brother that she had managed to withdraw a little money, the vulnerable woman lying on the rug in front of him stirred some emotions in him. I don't want to kill the lady ma, Larue responded to his mother, Marinda. A fuming Marinda then turned the revolver on Larue and ordered him to do his job, or she would kill both of them. 
Laru knew that his mother was perfectly capable of carrying out her threat and proceeded to strangle Hanley. After the different trials at the ATMs, Marcel and John headed straight back to the Kosana flat to explain to Marinda what had initially gone wrong. But by the time they entered the apartment, Hanley was already dead. Marcel then had to accompany John to get rid of Hanley's body. John loaded Hanley's body in a pick it up rubbish bin and pushed it downstairs and up to Hanley's car. But there was one more obstacle. Hanley's Hyundai vehicle was marked with the Remax stickers. With all the news reports doing the rounds, the gang had to be cautious. Then Cecilia suggested that they use a different vehicle instead of using the branded one. John and Marinda then placed Hanley's body upright on the back seat of Marinda's car. She was wrapped in a red blanket, her head resting against the window so that it looked as if she were asleep. Marcel then sat next to the body and to avoid suspicion, tried to keep it upright. While Laru was disposing of Hanley's handbag, John, Marinda and Marcel drove towards a particular location hoping to find a suitable place where the body wouldn't be found too quickly. They turned onto a dead road shortly after a sewage farm. John dragged Hanley's body from the car and dumped it among the bushes between the trees right next to the road which had a nearby stream just close to the Rand Fountain Cemetery. The threesome then returned via a road in Rand Fountain, tossing away some of Hanley's possessions while keeping with them her cell phone, wristwatch and wedding ring. The gold and diamond ring which LaRue later pawned. Back in Kruger's Dorp, Andre Hanley's husband was going crazy. It was 9 p.m. and there was still no sign of his wife. He later returned home to inform the rest of the family of what was going on. The gang of murderers had just reached home ground when the authorities traced Hanley's car to a net care hospital across the road from Kosana. The authorities had cordoned off the road and the threesome even faint surprised when they passed the roadblock on their way back to Marinda's apartment. Andre gave the authorities permission to break into his wife's car in case her body was in the boat, as had been the case with Anthony and Kevin, but there was no sign of her. At one stage, Cecilia, who had been home all evening, even went outside and spoke to members of the police force as a concerned resident would. How terrible! And this had all happened right in front of her house where she lived with her family. Cecilia had reportedly exclaimed. Shortly after that, the authorities left the area and the members of Elect to Spain they would remain inside the apartments. But once again, the killing hadn't proved much of a success for Cecilia and the gang. They had looted only 3,000 rands and made a little extra cash from selling Hanley's wedding ring. But by that time, the bank cards had all been cancelled. The following morning, a colonel of the Krugersdorp Criminal Investigation Unit notified Andre that a body had been found in the Tauten area. Children on their way to school early in the morning had stumbled upon a corpse. Obviously, it was Hanley's. She was the fourth person to be murdered by appointments by this evil group and the eleventh and final victim to suffer Cecilia and her group's merciless attacks. It was following her death after she had been found close to the stream by this group of school children that investigation into her death would start. After police learned that a withdrawal had been made on the victim's account, CCTV footage would be reviewed where the authorities in Kruger's dub began to trace the suspect, only to learn that an 18-year-old Marcel Stein, a 20-year-old Laru Stein, and the 38-year-old Jean Bernard where the individuals withdrawing money from an ATM with the bank card. This was one of the breakthroughs in the police investigation that led to the arrests. Following the arrest and after a series of interrogation sessions, Larue and Marcel gave an account of all the crimes that they had committed and the lives that they had ended. This led to the arrest of Zach Valentine, who was later tracked down in his place of hiding a week later. The insurance claim which the group had made with Cecilia Stein being the main beneficiary would link her to the group and she was also arrested. Then followed Marinda Stein who identified Gerald Jackson's body 
as that of Zax. During Marinda's testimony, she did mention how she and Cecilia Stein were devoted Christians despite the testimony of others that they were ringleaders of a satanic cult. Although she failed to respond when an advocate did put to her that there were signs of involvement in satanism, but she denied any knowledge of any satanic connections or being involved with wishes. The state also called 52 witnesses, some of whom were friends of the accused or had interacted with them and others who were relatives of the victims. One of the key state witnesses would turn out to be Ria Grunewald, the leader of OTC when Cecilia Stein was also part of the group and who was in hiding from Cecilia. Ria, during her testimony, told the court that she and Cecilia were extremely close and she treated her like a daughter. She also told the court how Cecilia had manipulated her and other members of the group. Ria described Cecilia as a master manipulator who had made those close to her believe that she was dying and was in constant need of medical care. She had also made numerous claims, including that she was a satanist and was the most powerful witch in the world and also a bride of Satan. It would be safe to say that Cecilia was a chronic liar. Another of her multiple lies was her claim on having supernatural powers, including the ability to walk on water, turning into a werewolf, and making things disappear and reappear. According to Ria and Cecilia's former best friend of four years, Candice Rijavec, who also later testified, Cecilia had told them that she could see if a person was pure or if they had demons. But the lies didn't end there. Candice, who said she met Cecilia Stein in 2008, after which they became inseparable best friends, had endless stories about her background. Cecilia had told her that her death was prophesied many years ago before she was born. Cecilia claimed to have been subjected to ritual abuse by her family, had become part of the occult, and had these supernatural powers. She also said she could do things to people without touching them. And also, she had gone through training and she met Satan. She had claimed that her spirit could leave her body. She had also claimed that she could travel to the moon and there were no limitations to where she could go. Cecilia had also claimed to be a vampire confined to certain areas. She had boundaries of where she could go. She once drove beyond these boundaries and she faked an SMS from her father saying she was aware of what she did. She fooled people into believing she could change into someone or something, and she could read minds. As three supernatural creatures neatly packaged into a single person, Cecilia claimed to have an array of occult powers. Candice also testified that Cecilia controlled her life. She was forced to wear the same clothes as Cecilia. If she wore something different, she was forced to change. She controlled and stole her identity to merge their personalities and everything they had to do, she had to look exactly like her. She also became attached to Cecilia and had undying loyalty and trust in her. Candice, just like Rhea, also described Cecilia as a master manipulator who lied about her health and claimed she was dying. Not just that, Candice had also given Cecilia money on several occasions to buy medications, although she would later find out that she was perfectly healthy. Candice Rijavec had also said that she had spent thousands on Cecilia and once gave her a hundred thousand rands of her own money to Cecilia. All the money she claimed was for medication, but Cecilia had however spent them on motorcycles and to fund her drinking habits. Cecilia, she said, had made friends believe that she needed constant washing because she was dying. She believed that story and did not want anyone to hurt her. Cecilia claimed to have had spiritual and physical attacks. She would vomit blood and convulse when she got the attacks. It would turn out that Cecilia had made people believe that she was actually vomiting blood when in reality she had put small balls of blood in her mouth and was just acting. She would drive to a place where there was no one, drop blood from herself using a syringe, take the blood and put it in a cut plastic gloves. She would put the small balls in her mouth and then fake a convulsion during these high nights. Cecilia had also said that her whole family was part of the occult and she was abused not only as a child but even when she was already married 
her father would astral project to essay her by using her husband. At times, he would even send demons to essay her. According to Candice, Cecilia suffered from dissociative identity disorder and had over 100 different personalities due to the trauma she had told her she went through as a child. A statement which Cecilia's real parents would later confirm to be all lies. Candice shocked the courts with her testimony. She explained that Cecilia had professed to be the bride of Satan and as such was forced to endure painful rituals. These rituals, as explained by her, were meant to unify Cecilia and Satan in powerful unholy matrimony. All of these powers, which according to Candice, were complete nonsense. She also said Cecilia watched exceptionally disturbing satanic movies, and she, Cecilia, would hook her friends up with boyfriends who they never met, as they communicated only via text messages, even going as far as hooking her Candice up with a man with whom they would only text, even dating for three years but never meeting in person. According to Candice, Cecilia had told them that these imaginary lovers were occultists trying to break away from the satanic church and could be killed if anyone found out they were dating Christians. That's why members of the Stain family were told they would never meet them in person and could only communicate with them via text messages. None of them suspected it was Cecilia on the other end of the phone. She had been completely manipulating the rest of her group members. During her testimony, Candice also recounted how Cecilia killed an imaginary lover known as Jean to punish Marinda for a minor annoyance. Marinda became so hysterical when told the love of her life was dead that she had to be taken to hospital where she was given medication to calm her. Though Candice badly wanted to tell the heartbroken woman the truth, Cecilia prevented her from doing so. She believed that had Marinda known about this elaborate lie, she would have broken her unnatural loyalty to Cecilia and turned on her during the trial. A married journalist known as Marisa Quetza, who later fell in love and dated LaRue for a while during the trial, also provided further evidence of Cecilia's manipulation tactic. From her discussions with LaRue, she recounted how Cecilia turned the imaginary girlfriend she had invented for LaRue into a hostage to get him to go along with the first of the appointment killings. The girl had supposedly been kidnapped after her mother stole money from the satanic church to fund Cecilia's psychology sessions. Cecilia told LaRue that the girl would be killed unless the members of Electus Payday would found a way to pay it back. According to Candice, Cecilia later claimed to have left Satanism and converted to Christianity. Yet, she still performed Satanic rituals. Unfortunately, it was during a time of Satanic panic in Kruger's Dub, in which so many people believed so many bizarre stories about the occult that Cecilia had taken advantage of to brainwash and manipulate so many of her Electus Pedeus group members. It was in that environment she thrived in, while deceiving so many smart individuals who saw themselves as a circle of friends. The first three members to be tried all admitted guilt. They were John Barnard, Marinda and Larue. In December 2016, a 40-year-old John Barnard who was tried separately from the rest of the group was sentenced to 30 years in jail, with 10 years to be suspended on the condition that he testify against the others. He did testify as a state witness and was given a 20 year sentence. The arsenal of weapons that found in Marida's flat after LaRue's arrest would be displayed in court as evidence. It included a .38 special revolver used to subdue and threaten the victims, as well as the 9mm pistol they had used to kill Glenn including various ammunitions which Marinda had hidden in a room behind the classroom where she thought. According to LaRue, after the last killing, Cecilia had been insisting he take out a life insurance policy in his name. LaRue, who by that stage indicated he wanted to leave the group, later realized that unlike Zach, his death probably wouldn't have been faked. He also testified on how they would call Cecilia only by the first letter of her name, C, because Cecilia had told them that seeing her full name would summon demons. 
LaRue testified that the modus operandi in the last killings had been basically the same and added that the motive had been to financially benefit Cecilia. He went on to testify how they would dispose of the victim's body. Both Anthony and Kevin were left in the boot of their car while the key was still in the ignition. Anthony's body was abandoned outside a primary school while Kevin's car had been lost in a distant street, an area notorious for its drugs and prostitution. Hence the reason people thought it was a drug business deal gone wrong during the initial investigation. The group had reckoned that the car, body and all, was more likely to be stolen there. This showed the level of planning they had applied before, during and after each crime. One of the most gruesome parts in Larue's testimony was when he described Kevin McAlpine's killing. Though he had been the one to strangle Kevin, he would mention that his mother, Marinda Stein, and Cecilia had ordered him to do it. After finishing Kevin, my mother went down to fetch C in her flat. C came up to the flat and she even gave Kevin a kick. On hearing this statement from Larue, Kevin's wife, who was seven months pregnant at the time of his killing, sobbed in court when she heard how the killers had treated her husband's dead body. In 2018, a 51-year-old Marinda Stein pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 11 life sentences and 115 years for all the other crimes she committed, which included fraud, racketeering, and managing an enterprise illegal possession of ammunition and firearms, defeating the ends of justice, robbery and accessory after the fact of murder. In total, she received a 390 year sentence. Marinda is currently serving her time in the Johannesburg South Prison and will most likely never see her children again. At her sentencing appearance, a judge would ask her if she had understood the claims against her and the consequences of her actions. Her emotionless reply was, one has choices and you need to bear the consequences. Marinda, who seemed to be the second in command of the group, was so loyal to Cecilia and even went as far as signing Cecilia to be the sole beneficiary of her properties instead of her children. She stipulated in the will document that Cecilia could use her estate as she wishes, stating that it was hers alone. During her testimony, she had also desperately tried to exonerate Cecilia and her daughter Marcel from all the crimes they had committed in the hopes she could save both ladies from being convicted while she takes the fall. As for Larry Stein, he was however sentenced to 35 years immediate imprisonment with a 10 year suspended sentence to testify in the trial. It was also due to his and John Banner's testimony that we came to get a clearer picture of the evil activities of this group. He is currently serving an effective 25 years sentence in jail. Many who attended the court proceedings commented that his sentence was too light, believing that he played a big part in the murders. During the court proceedings, LaRue would mention how during their killing spree, there was also a plan which was put in place to kill his own father, whom he had no relationship with, as Marinda had taken them away from him after their separation. According to LaRue, he joined the group after he was made to believe by his mother that his father never loved him. Marinda led him to believe that his father never wanted him and if he didn't do it their way, he would be out on the street and he was still a child at the time. He also claimed that his mother signed fraudulent documents to change his son name without his father's permission. However, after he turned 18, he started rebuilding his relationship with his father as they went on fishing trips and had built cupboards together, even though Cecilia and his mother didn't approve of the relationship, as he was told that his father's demons were stuck to his and that he shouldn't see him, hence he stopped talking to him for a year. But as desperation for money kicked in, he was told by Cecilia to kill his father to claim his life policy, and since Cecilia had told him that his father was allergic to bees, he was told to look for bees which he was to throw into his father's drink so that the bees would sting him whenever they went fishing together. Not just that, according to LaRue, they had also planned to use syringes to inject his father and if the plan didn't work, Marinda had insisted she should be killed instead for the life insurance money. However, this very disturbing plan 
never materialized. The last three members of the group were charged a year later, which was on the 19th of August 2019, after they had initially pleaded not guilty. During the trial, Marcel admitted to being on the scene for several of the killings, while multiple witnesses implicated Valentine as someone who played a major role in some of the Kruger's top killings, including LaRue and Marcel, who played a role as a foot soldier. Marcel also acknowledged that there were police officers who visited Cecilia's husband at her house, although she didn't tell any of them what was going on because she was scared they wouldn't believe her if she told them everything. Not only was Marinda pure evil, she was also a very bad mother. Marcel would also reveal how in 2013, Marinda had allegedly told Cecilia that a group of people had visited the school where she was teaching and where both Marcel and LaRue were learners at the time. The group came to speak to the children about drug abuse. Cecilia then told them that the group was exaggerating and she went ahead and bought a quantity of metcatinone for the whole group to try. Marcel claimed that all the groups used drugs from time to time. They reportedly used these drugs, which is a highly addictive psychoactive substance similar to crack cocaine, before they later moved on to crystal meth. Marcel was 14 years old when she used these drugs for the first time and continued using them up until the time she was arrested. Marinda was also apparently fine with Marcel using drugs as long as they were provided by Cecilia. Also, according to Marcel, Marinda and Zach wrote a prayer together and personalized it for the group. In this prayer, they referred to the Electus Pedeus wishes and children, and after which the group voluntarily got status. To the victims and their family, Marcel would say, I thought a lot about what I could say, what I want to say, and basically what it boils down to. The short version is, I'm very sorry. I know my testifying and telling the truth and admitting how sorry I am does not break them back. It does not take the pain away and you work with that for the rest of your lives and I contributed. I am sorry. I am really sorry, she said. After a series of court proceedings that opened a Pandora box for the revelation of the heinous crimes that were committed by this evil group, the court finally delivered judgment on the last three suspects all of whom initially pleaded not guilty. They were Cecilia, Zach, and Marcel. In 2018, a 38-year-old Cecilia, who admitted to being gay and who was also a mother of two children, would divorce her now ex-husband, and restain. In court, Cecilia testified that she was a lesbian who had affairs with women while she was married, and that was why she and her husband slept in separate rooms. It was a marriage in name only, she said. She told the judge that they married to have children, which was a priority in both their lives. Cecilia, together with the 34-year-old Zach Valentine and the 21-year-old Marcel Stein, were found guilty of the 11 counts of murder, including other counts such as fraud, racketeering, robbery, intimidation, aggravated assault, causing an explosion, destruction of properties, managing an enterprise, identity theft, possession of unlicensed firearm, and for defeating the ends of justice. They were sentenced to a collective 28 life terms, with none of them showing any sort of emotions as the sentences were handed over to them. In South Africa, a life sentence equals 25 years in prison. In finding the trio guilty, the judge rejected the evidence given by Cecilia, Marcel, and Valentine. He said they had been part of an enterprise, with Cecilia being the mastermind and the beneficiary of the proceeds. The court described Cecilia as an instigator, a pathological liar, and the person who issued instructions and manipulated her co-accused. According to the judge, he would say, it had been shown that she lied about her need for spiritual protection, her qualification, the fake boyfriends and girlfriends, her denial in the involvement of a cult doesn't make sense. Without Cecilia's involvement, none of the killings would have taken place, he said. Valentine was handed down eight life sentences to run concurrently, an additional 66 years also to run concurrently with the life sentences for the other counts against him. 
a whooping total of 266 years was to be served. Cecilia Stein, who was believed to be the group's mastermind, was handed out 13 life sentences to run concurrently with an additional 152 years for the other counts against her in prison. A combined total of 477 years was given to the puppet master. Marcel told the court she could not leave the group because she was afraid they would find her and kill her and how her mother was controlling, dominating, uninvolved and neglectful. Marinda, according to her, was physically abusive and would hit Marcel and LaRue with an iron bat. But the court rejected Marcel's evidence and the timing of her telling the truth. Her claim that she had been manipulated by Cecilia and her mother, Marinda, holds no water, said the judge. The court said Marcel was highly intelligent and knew what she had gotten herself into. Her change of heart to tell the truth was described by the court as a tactical decision. Without mercy, Marcel was sentenced to 15 years in jail for the killings she committed before turning 18. And for those crimes she committed when she was an adult, she must serve seven life sentences which were to run concurrently, with an additional 144 years for the other counts to also run concurrently. Marcel is currently serving a total of 334 years in a story which the judge described as the worst case he has presided over in his 18 years as a judge. A story from the pits of hell, he said. While delivering the verdict, the judge would say that the group should have called themselves elected by Lucifer rather than chosen by God. Until this day, Cecilia still believes that she is innocent and a victim. Why Cecilia's parents believe in Cecilia's innocence despite her daughter's lies and also being found guilty of being the mastermind behind a four-year killing spree in Kruger's dub. Before I end this very long story that affected so many people, the wife of Kevin McAlpine, Keziah McAlpine, would say that she has had to constantly lie to her three-year-old son about what happened to his father who never saw when his wife put to bed or when his son was born. She was relieved that the trial was over and that they can now move on with their lives. The families of the victims were satisfied with the judgment and they finally saw justice served. And although it wouldn't bring back their lost ones, however, they will no longer have to live with the fear of the murderers being among them and we hope it brings some sort of closure to all those who knew and loved the victims as their memory still lives on. Murdered Rich Ben Dixon was due to the relationship or what he did to Ria, according to your evidence. From my point of view, yes. He corrupted them, if we can refer to it as a, as a He made her a very bitter person, yes. A bitter person. So he had to be killed? I decided so, yes. Why? because you had to be stopped from making her better so that she could be back to the person that she was. But is that the reason to kill someone? Partially, yes. <clears throat> As I said before, I wanted also to feel what it feels like to kill someone and I wanted to kill him. She testified that you could see with the third eye into the spiritual realm. No, I can't. What do you say? I can't. Did you ever mention something like this to her? That I can see with the third yes. eye? No. No. And that you actually could have read her mind. There's other testimony also that you had the power to read someone's mind. No. What would you say to that? I can't read people's minds. 